Welcome, everybody, and good afternoon. Welcome to Behind the Screen, a Connected Educator Month webinar that looks at how educational games can be effective, engaging learning tools. I am Frank Gallagher. I'm Executive Director of Cable in the Classroom. And today I'm joined by Christy Timms, the Executive Director of the Digital Learning Group, and by Layla Mastery, the President of Bean Creative. Our three organizations recently built Coaster Crafter, which is an immersive STEM learning game designed for students in grades 6 through 12, particularly girls. In this game, students explore and practice key STEM concepts by designing, building, and sharing virtual roller coasters. And they get to interact with a cast of engaging and unique characters in a fun, carnival-like online environment. Now, Christy and Layla and their teams did a great job, and we're proud that Coaster Crafter just earned a very high five-star rating from Common Sense Media. Now, in creating Coaster Crafter, we had to deal with a lot of the things that determine whether or not a game is engaging for kids and whether or not kids actually learn anything from playing it. And that gave us the idea for this webinar. With all the attention being given to games and education, we thought it might be interesting to peer behind the curtain and talk about what goes into creating a game from the inside so that the educators who then have to evaluate and use games with their students can get a better idea of what to look for. So the topics for today's webinar will focus on what does the research say about games what are the primary types of games? What sort of thinking goes into the process behind creating a game? What are the steps that go into bringing a game to fruition? How are the educational concepts woven into the storyline of a game? How do you balance the entertainment aspects with the education aspects? How do you build this thing so that you can make sure that some learning actually takes place? How do you create the educational content, particularly the teacher support materials? And as an educator, what kind of features should you be looking for in educational games? So that, those are our goals for today. And one last thing, what is Cable in the Classroom and why are we involved in this? Well, Cable in the Classroom is the education foundation of the U.S. cable industry. And for 25 years now, we have worked with and on behalf of cable companies and networks, providing K-12 schools with connections and content, whether video programs over cable TV or interactive websites by high-speed broadband. Our work is mainly in three areas around cable's educational programming, websites, initiatives, and resources, in digital literacy, and exploring the power of broadband for learning. And it is in this last area, broadband, that we've created four game-like explorations of topics, from presidential elections to Shakespeare's language to now STEM and roller coasters. We chose STEM and Coaster Crafter because of the national conversation about a shortage of STEM graduates. That's an issue that affects the cable industry as well as our national economy. And cable operators and networks themselves have created a variety of different STEM initiatives. But we chose a game, and we chose middle school as a target age because it is there that many kids seem to lose interest in STEM subjects. And it's also where the foundation for STEM careers begin. We chose roller coasters because there's something most kids love and find exciting. And we chose our partners because they were experts in game design and in putting education front and center. Now, just a quick word about housekeeping. Because there are so many people signed up for this webinar, all the participants have been placed on mute for now. Please jot down any questions or comments you may have as the webinar progresses. Around halfway through, a box will appear on your screen in which you can type and submit questions either for a specific presenter or for any of us to respond to. We have built in time at the end of the presentation to answer a number of these questions, but as they're all being recorded, any questions we don't get to then, we can answer by email after the end of the webinar. 
We are also recording the webinar, and the recorded version should be available next week from the Cable in the Classroom website. At, uh, and now, with that, I will turn it over to Christy Timms at the Digital Learning Group to say a few words about um, herself, her background, and uh, go into the next session of her program. Thanks, Frank. Um, very briefly, DLG is a Maryland-based nonprofit, and we specialize in the creation of innovative e-learning tools and related media and print for children and adults. Um, our services include content and course development, educational, interactive, and game conceptualization and scripting, educational tool development, and outreach and promotion for most of our projects. Our primary role in the Cable in the Classroom in game um, involved creative concepting, content development, standards correlation, video production, and the scripting of the entire game and its related teacher's guide. Uh, we came into the project knowing the game had to involve roller coasters and that it had to teach physics. But then we had to go a lot further by creating an, inter an interesting context or story for the game, likable and relatable characters, and we had to add a special dose of humor to get the kids interested and engaged. We also needed a structure that took into account the latest research in games, learning, and student engagement. Um, the field of research about game use and effectiveness in education has evolved a lot over the last 10 years as uh, more and more scholars begin to study games and their value in the classroom. I mean, there are not many education journals you can open these, these days and not see some kind of article about a new game or thinking about the use of games in classrooms. So the first thing we did was to turn to an expert in educational games who uh, is studying at the University of Pittsburgh, and he helped us sort of uh, look at all of the types of, of games that are successful with kids and uh, help us unpack the theory behind all of those so that we could then apply them to this game. So I'm going to go through them um, here very briefly so that you all can understand, um, as Frank mentioned, some of this um, thinking behind the curtain that went on as we developed the game. Um, the first area is motivation. Um, games, of course, have a real motivational advantage. Um, there's a huge body of research that shows that games provide opportunity for gains in intrinsic motivation, such as challenges, goals, and feedback. And this is somewhat different from extrinsic motivators that you might have in a, you know, a board-based game or some game you might do in a classroom where kids get rewarded just for completing something. Yeah, and while roller coasters are an American cultural icon and can leverage, you know, sort of natural player interest because they're fun and cool, we knew it was imperative that um, game play itself have to be motivating um, so that we could preserve that intrinsic motivation that, that's important. So the context of the roller coasters was not enough just to establish or, prefer, or uh, preserve intrinsic motivation. Our game had to include really captivating elements to ensure users would play with it and return to play with it again. And many of these things Layla will expand upon when she um, jumps into the talk later on. Um, epi epistemic thinking is a more recent but a key theory that is uh, related to the advantage games have in generating opportunities for epistemological thinking. So there are very outdated objectives like rote memorization that we are learning are not always optimal for children's learning. Instead, games are sort of better at providing an opportunity for a learner to generate thinking about a subject, um, which is you know, generally a more well-regarded educational objective. So in applying this theory to the roller coaster game, um, uh, this was reflected in our decision to require players to think as professionals who use, for, who use physics in their everyday lives. So for coaster crafters, we have our players um, act and think like designers, engineers, and architects when they play the game. Um, constructionism research is another body which has highlighted the value of construction within games. So learners who are encouraged to create objects within a game become creators of their own knowledge. Um, the learning advantages are 
pretty clear with this. Um, first, it's motivational. Um, if you're able to create something, you're, you're very motivated to do it oftentimes. And there are general learning gain, gains that students achieve when they are in charge of creating their own knowledge. Uh, for Coaster Crafter, we wanted our players to construct elements that relate to the play of the game, not just simple design elements like changing the color of a car or the shape of a car on a roller coaster. So we moved beyond mere customization of elements to encourage our users to actually build and, try, and use trial and error with functioning roller coasters. Uh, simulations. Um, at their core, games are really a set of sort of arbitrary rules that are imposed on a scenario. But a simulation is designed more to recreate a setting and actions within the setting. The challenge in a roller coaster game is, is sort of to find that sweet spot between having enough simulation quality so that it feels real and cool and um, enough game-like qualities for, for maximum appeal and learning value. And then you have to do all of this within a, a budget constraints, of course. So our takeaway here was that we would um, be best served to use some simulations to teach discrete elements about physical science. And we do so in, in an area called coaster challenges that you'll learn about a little bit later. Then there are multiplayer games. Um, this is yet another body of research that's looked at how teams of players can often overcome a pretty complex challenge if they're playing um, with their peers. Um, the opportunity to receive feedback and motivation provided by the interaction with those peers often helps kids perform at a higher level. Um, budget restrictions prohibited us from creating a, a big multiplayer game, but we were able to take some of the, some of the important tenets of that and apply it to, to it, and uh, particularly to give some instructions in the teacher's game for how you could encourage kids to mirror that collaborative pr process um, when you work on this together in the classroom. Um, gamification. Um, a sort of more recent development in game research has been the, the distillation of games into their, their core elements and then applying those to learning opportunities. So an example of that might be teachers who gamify their classrooms by doing things like giving kids or teams of kids points for everyday tasks and then maybe displaying those points in some kind of, um, uh, in a prominent area in the classroom. Uh, this, this area of research is one that's, a, that's new and, and has a little bit of controversy around it. So we didn't want to get too caught up in it, but we thought, we thought it was interesting nonetheless. Because there are many educators who believe that game, gamification represents uh, a, a great way for enhancing motivation with kids. So we determined that the design of the roller coaster game would stay away from simple gamification, but we would include some features of games in our classroom activities, such as earning points for good critiques or for suggesting, for suggesting kids, um, for kids suggesting to their peers other ways they might accomplish goals in the game. And finally, there is transformational play. Um, this is when a player takes on the role of a protagonist in a game to solve a problem. Um, so while the while the creation of a realistic context might seem irrelevant to casual gameplay, researchers think that it can be key to producing significant learning games. Um, you know, originally we wanted to wrap our game in a very full narrative story to compel our users, but we realized that um, we didn't really have to go that far and that we'd be better served to build in lots of open-ended themes that encourage the kids' create creativity and that way the game could appeal to a very um, broad audience. So we decided to include multiple elements that are important to most students, things like school, the environment, making money, and of course um, going to amusement parks. As you learn more about the actual structure and features of the game, you'll see how these theories are at work um, in almost all of our thinking about it. Um, we were not aware of any established set of design categories for games that teach just physics. So we had to look around for types of games that have been developed, and, and we settled mainly in the mathematics world to look at structures for games that have been, 
that have been reviewed and have had success so that we could, again, have another set of rules that would help us before we started developing the content for the game. And there are just a couple of these. It's not such a long list. Um, the first is memorization games. I mean, these, these mean what they say. They're games that are designed to facilitate memorization of principles, theories, or laws. The design of this type of game is usually can be pretty far removed from the actual content or physics in this case. So think of a classroom game like Jeopardy where you know, most of the questions are just based on having physics knowledge. That would sort of be an example of this. To put this kind of a game into a, a roller coaster context, we would have just had to include a roller coaster that moves up and down a track when a, when a player answers um, an unrelated question concerning physics. So this wasn't really an area of focus um, that we wanted to utilize for the game. The second was procedures without connections. And this is a category of game, again, that's, um, that has very little connection to scientific, scientific instruction. So while the design of the game is usually based on a specific physics principle, such as gravity or inertia, success in the game does not require um, explicit knowledge of those things. A good example of this type of game is Angry Birds. Um, that has a little bit of simple physics in it, but it doesn't really require an understanding of physics by the player to be able to have fun with it and use it. A roller coaster version of this type of game would simply be one where a player would control maybe the speed of the coaster in order to make sure it did not fly off the tracks and crash. So while there, there are clear physics principles at work, such as force, there's no need for a player to become very familiar with the principles to be successful at the game. Then it gets a little bit more interesting and relevant for the purposes of this game. Um, in a game that has procedures with connections, players must have some basic understanding of the subject matter or physics in, uh, in order to be successful in the game. The physics knowledge could come implicitly or, expl or explicitly depending on the type of game they're playing. Um, there's a casual version of this type of category game called Bridgecraft where people have to uh, create bridges, and they must have a very basic understanding of the physics of bridge construction in order to be successful in the game. So applying this theory to a roller coaster game, um, we would have to make the physics more explicit so that concept, concepts such as potential energy or kinetic energy are put in the forefront of the game and they're used as a clear way to be successful in the game. And you'll, you'll see later how that's done. And lastly, there's doing physics itself. Um, this would describe games that requires players to do physics or use the knowledge of physics to actually solve a problem. Players aren't given procedures to be successful within the game, but they're required to construct a personal set of knowledge in order to be successful. A roller coaster example of this would be a simulation that requires players to engage in some aspects of roller coaster design. The simulator would include some of the finer details of how a roller coaster, um, of how roller coasters work, in order to allow players to gain a complete knowledge of the physics of roller coaster design. Cable in the Classroom asked us to create a very engaging roller coaster game that would include scientific principles such as velocity, acceleration, gravity, potential, and kinetic energy. So, with those. With those concepts in mind, we turn to the most relevant set of national standards to refine our focus and then to generate a narrow set of cross-curricular standards that would guide our content development and would then help teachers use the resources effectively in the classroom. The standards we re reviewed included the National Science Education Standards that were produced by the National Research Council and that are used by NSTA. Uh, while we couldn't use the Common Core standards at the time we began this game uh, over a year ago, we were aware of the impending changes in those that needed to be reflected in the game, and we'll mention a little bit about that in just a second. Um, of course, any game that requires teachers to build roller coasters also addresses technology and engineering concepts. So to include those, we looked to ITEA, which is the International Society for Technology and Education, and the ISTE standards. The ITEA standards seem to offer um, 
a great deal in terms of the focus on the designed world, which is really what we were after. Um, their philosophy is that design is tech to technology as literacy is to language. So uh, we carefully reviewed those standards and then were able to select ones that were appropriate for our game. We also looked to the Common Core standards in math and to the NCTM standards to try to include some mathematical extensions, which seem logical for this type of content. Um, both of those standards are very, very specific to skills, proofs, and traditional math. So it was a little challenging to find associations with our game that we felt ultimately was going to involve a lot of estimation and conjecture. So we determined that we could, we could adequately argue that players may internally and intuitively use some processes. So we included one strong mathematics goal in our teacher's guide that we present opportunities for students to use estimation and judge the reasonableness of their estimates as they work to design and test roller coasters. So that we are, we are um, uh, carefully um, connected across three curricular areas for our game. As I mentioned earlier, of course, the Common Core Standards in Science are, uh, I guess, in review and about to come out, and we were aware of them when we began to create the game. And those standards are calling for changes in the emphases that have traditionally marked the teaching of science in this country, um, and therefore they validate a project such as Coaster Crafter because they promote this active investigation of science principles. Um, the game encourages students to experiment with complex scientific principles in a, in a pretty non-judgmental way and to think for themselves as they try to translate experiences into knowledge. Um, specifically, the Common Core Standards are going to call for a number, number of emphases which we think are relevant to the development of, or relevant to the development of our game. Um, specifically, they called for um, students to learn subject matter in the context of inquiry, which might include, include project-based learning. They should engage in activities. Uh, they should in, in, engage in activities that investigate and analyze science questions. They should use multiple process skills, such as manipulation, cognitive, and procedural ones, not just memorization. And they should use evidence and strategies for developing or revising an explanation. Um, with this game, we were also asked to develop a very succinct and strong teacher's guide. Um, we hope you all have had time to check that out, but we encourage, we encourage you to do so because it's, it's very short and gets, gets to the point in very, very quickly. So there's not a time does not have to be devoted to getting started with use of the game in a classroom. Um, the guide offers an, obviously an overview of gameplay that's um, uh, very simplistic and easy to read. There are user-friendly instructions for how to uh, bring it up and use it in the classroom very quickly. Um, we provide some general information about um, games and learning so that you can get a, a little bit of this research that um, I've been describing as I go through the presentation. We provide a variety of types of lesson plans, some that are designed um, to allow teachers to use the game as quickly as one class period to achieve a goal, but there's also suggestions for how you might might use the game over a longer period of time, such as a week, uh, to cover material. We provide real-world real examples with ideas for field trips or other virtual resources that can enhance our content. And then, of course, we pro provide strong and relevant links to other physics, engineering, and math content that is relatable. Um, Coaster Crafter also includes a number of um, uh, interesting video interviews with STEM scientists, and I would encourage folks to take a look at those because they are fun and they help kids understand how the study of science and physics might translate into something they might do later in their life. Um, there are a number of reasons that um, we want to conclude with um, of why you might want to use games to enhance learning in your classroom. Um, first and foremost, and I think everybody knows this at this point, that that games uh, often can motivate students just because they're so much fun. Um, they often can resemble games that students play online and with their handheld devices on, in their spare time, so they're excited to get on them and try them out. Um, they're very good at helping making, making abstract concepts more concrete. Um, a teacher can draw momentum on the board and try to explain it. But more often than not, it's just not a substitute for seeing it in action in a virtual and realistic setting. 
And games also appeal to students with multiple learning styles, those who are more visual, hands-on, or auditory learners in particular. Um, today, and particularly in the state of Maryland, there's, there's so many more teachers who are embracing the theory of universal design for learning. And in doing so, they're off, often looking for resources that can appeal to a wide variety of learners. And educational games are a great resource to serve this need. Um, finally, I wanted to give you guys just a little bit of an overview of the creative process of translating all of this dense research and all of these ideas and all of these standards into um, a compelling game and resource for students and teachers. Uh, for, as a first step in our creative process, our team usually generates multiple treatments or approaches to how we might cover the information. So we come up with different ideas for characters, different scenarios, different locations where the whole thing might take place. And then that's vetted by the entire project team, including teachers, writers, content experts, the folks at Cable in the Classroom, and the developers at Being Creative, so that we can determine the strongest one. While the treatment includes some overviews of potential character types, further characterizations are generated to help paint vivid pictures of each personality before the developers even try to sketch them. Um, in this instance, we try to focus on a smart and witty female character who's constantly questioning the coaster designs of her penny-pinching father. We were careful not to paint the adult as stupid. Rather, we aimed for a sort of engaging and humorous tension between them because, after all, most of our audience were te are teenagers. And while we couldn't take the time to weave a long or complicated story, we knew from research, uh, because, because we knew from research that's not an asset, um, we did want to offer a short intro to the characters and their world to increase engagement and buy-in and to help our, our players identify with their characters. So you will see a, a nice story that starts off at the beginning of the game that the children can choose to watch or not watch as they desire. Um, Humor is a really important part of anything that we create. Uh, we think it's really important for teachers and for students to increase, to increase the entertainment value of an educational project. So we used ancillary characters and we played up that playful tension between the daughter and the father throughout the game to achieve some of that. And finally, we had to make sure we, we structured the play to support learning. Our game is divided into three sections. Um, design challenges, coaster challenges, and a free play area. The design challenges introduce students to key STEM concepts um, in the game, and they sort of function like a t tutorial on each subject. The coaster challenges are where students begin to develop their mastery of what they have learned by applying it. And then we have a free play area where they can create and share their personal coasters at any point during gameplay. The game play begins very heavily structured, but as students make progress, they can encounter challenges that are more free form in, no, that are more free form in no, nature. Um, while the game's goals remain consistent throughout to build a great roller coaster, there are also multiple ways for any student to achieve that goal. And now I'm going to pass it over to Layla, who is going to go into much more detail about the uh, structure of the game and the creative process for building it. Hi there, this is Layla, and uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen that has my name. Um, so I'm Layla Mossry from Being Creative. I'm the president here. And just a little bit of background on us. Um, we're a 15-year-old studio of interactive developers, and we create everything from websites, as you've seen here, um, to mobile games and apps. Our specific niche is working in educational gaming. We've done everything from web games for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and a top-selling app, um, Super Y, for PBS Kids, to some really immersive educational games for tweens and teens, much like you've seen here, um, covering everything from the ecology of the Chesapeake Bay to the life and times of Edgar Allan Poe. And what's really amazing we found over these past um, 15 years is that designing educational games for preschoolers doesn't actually differ all that dramatically from games for middle and high schoolers. Um, I'm excited to be here today with Cable in the Classroom and with Digital Learning Group uh, to discuss the fundamental philosophies behind creating these successful educational games um, in the context of this launch. So let me dive right in. Uh, first and foremost, a successful educational game begins by determining the education content. 
Um, how do we take that, create a storyline, and weave the learning into the game? Obviously, you've heard quite a bit um, from Christy on the many, many nuances that go into just the beginning educational structure and the, the formulation of, of um, you know, the learning that will be the underpinnings of the game. Um, but there's a lot that goes into what we do here at Being Creative as well. Um, we've developed absolutely hand in hand um, with the content developers. Um, we sat at the table at the very beginning of the process um, with Christy and her team as well as with Cable in the Classroom. And we began thinking about the ways to make the learning components fun and how to step folks through the process in a way that, that supports knowledge transfer. Um, and that's really important. I'll delve into that a little bit further. Um, you know, we can't just create a game for the purpose of building a game. Um, oftentimes, it makes the most sense to start with the big picture learning objectives, um, as Christy's outlined, and then think about possible ways that we can um, create a game that, that could teach these. Um, and it's quite fun to create games for education. Gaming aligns really well with teaching. Um, you step kids through levels of knowledge gain um, progressively, and as they master, they unlock um, new knowledge and new ways to attack problems. So we find this really tends to go uh, quite well together. Um, and we start at the very beginning saying, you know, how can we teach these goals using games. Um, the narrative absolutely originates with the learning objectives. In this case, we were trying to teach a variety of different STEM topics. Um, so we sat here and we said, OK, we want to teach physics concepts, and we want to do this with a roller coaster game, and we want to set this in a crazy theme park, and it's going to be run by this bumbling engineer and his smart daughter, and the players have to come in and fix mistakes and improve designs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we start kind of um, creating a framework um, that works with a storyline, but also works with um, teaching objectives. Um, we also looked at our competitors. You know, there are, are other coaster creation games out there for use in teaching STEM initiatives. Um, what we did is, is we went through and, and looked at those and said, who's doing what? Um, who's doing things well? Who, are, who do we not want to emulate? Um, who are doing things right? And more, most importantly, where are there opportunities where others are not teaching the things that we know need to be taught? Um, as Christy mentioned earlier, there were, there were some games where there was very little you could control. You know, you could adjust the speed, or you could do a few um, nips and tucks here and there, but were more superficial. And we really wanted to get kids learning. So um, for our purposes, it was really important to make sure that we had that strong focus and we identified exactly where we could really make a difference here. Um, and this image shows here, um, and I know Christy showed this image as well, I believe, um, the teacher's guide, but this is the essence of how we created these learning objectives and how we wove them into the fabric of the game. Um, any great learning game will have a fantastic teacher section with insight into this practice and, and lots of resources uh, to share. Um, balancing act is certainly something that needs to be considered here. Um, it's key to ensure the balance of education with entertainment and to structure activities so that um, we can ensure that learning takes place. Uh, first and foremost, there has to be a balance to create a cohesive gaming experience. Um, as I mentioned, you can't just build an amazing, just awesome, just for fun game um, where you shoehorn in some learning experiences. Um, just as you can't build uh, a lesson with superficial fun stuff pasted on top. Um, neither one of those are actually much fun for anybody. And any um, student, even as young as a five-year-old, will see right through that. Um, so structuring learning pieces for an educational game requires an outline so that you map all the standards that have to be taught. And then you distill how these are best taught um, so that you can determine how to uh, best appeal to the age range and how to use the best interaction um, interactivity to teach them. So target age, as I just mentioned, um, being creative builds learning aids for preschoolers who are often preliterate, all the way to high school and adult learners. And as you can imagine, the gaming structure and elements vary by age. Um, just as a kind of quick overview, young children uh, typically work best with a more linear process, um, where you have more of a cause and effect, um, pretty standard straightforward type of, of learning experience um, and, a, and a path toward experimenting and mastery. Um, they also need more support, especially the, for those with lower literacy levels, and a bright, fun, cheerful interface in which to learn. 
Um, as you can see here from the various screenshots you've seen, um, many of the supports we build for young kids also work really well for older learners um, with some uh, important tweaks. As you can see here um, in the Coaster Crafter image, we offer multiple choice answers um, that have both imagery and text. So um, we're embracing different kinds of learners, as Christy mentioned earlier. Um, it also gives students support to work through the problems. Um, we're not just throwing them to the walls of the blank answer field that they're supposed to complete. Um, as if there was ever a not fun part of a learning game, that would absolutely be it. Uh, we also are providing um, real world insight from video industry experts explaining why this stuff actually matters. That's in the lower right corner of the screen there. Um, Brunette, our female character, keeps the storyline going with a mix of explanation and silliness. Um, and there's also a key for the STEM formulas provided at all times to help with the problem solving. And all of this is wrapped up in a fun um, but age appropriate interface that has some pretty zany animated characters um, that appeals to this tween and teen sensibilities. We would never use um, kind of a hairy um, carny guy for anything for the preschool audience, but it, it works well um, in this scenario. Um, as Christy mentioned, you know, there are three levels of play here. Um, and they do get progressively harder. And this um, does le le lead right into the uh, conversation about scaffolding and leveling. Um, so we can ensure we're teaching the right subject matter and that we progress appropriately. Um, we've built in scaffolding and leveling components. Um, it makes the learning games approachable. And it also avoids frustration if this skill isn't mastered at the first go. Um, it gives you more extensive game with a longer, um, more um, more ability to, to repeat and have uh, additional gameplay. And this is true whether you're designing for preschoolers or high schoolers. You don't want to be prescriptive. You want to give them enough nuance in the game that they can truly make it their own. Um, in Coaster Crafter, we have three different levels, and you have to unlock each level um, with successful completion of, of the prior level. Um, and in this case, what you're seeing here is an example of a design challenge where you're going through, as Christy mentioned, doing these tutorials. Um, and then later on, you get to things where you can play. Um, when you finish a design challenge, you unlock a, a coaster challenge, where you actually get pieces of a coaster, and you get to start um, experimenting and playing with these um, STEM concepts that you've learned. Um, in addition, it's really important, as I noted, randomization is, is huge um, in games like this. Um, we offer lots of options, whether it's in this um, scenario or in an app we created for um, PBS Kids that I had mentioned earlier. In that case, we had randomized programming that, that showed different games. And within each game, showed different words, letters, um, and, and all kinds of, of uh, different pieces to keep it fresh and interesting. Uh, in Coaster Crafter, we built this the same way, uh, even though the audience is a lot more sophisticated. So we give users the feeling of accomplishment once the skill is mastered, and they want to learn the next skill so they can move forward and collect rewards and to win. So this cause and effect encourages learning. And finally, it's really in important to include supports. Um, a character like Brunette is, is absolutely here to be um, not only a, a, a funny sidekick, but, but to be a helper. They offer assistance in a friendly and unobtrusive way, um, which is a huge difference as opposed to reading a help document or even asking a teacher. Um, so we have, in, in all of the games that we build that are educational games, we build um, characters and we weave them into the game um, so that folks who are not grasping the material and get frustrated and give up or, or worse, leave. Um, this is a very similar approach to get video gaming. Um, you're not left in complete frustration. Um, it, it depends on who we're building for, but we'll often build in failure. Um, so we might let a kid fail two or three times before we offer the help. You want to have kids work through problems without immediately rushing up and saying, OK, here's the answer. Um, it's a very proven device for le letting them have some, some success and, and trial and error, but also helping them keep moving through um, the game in a way that is fun and satisfactory for them. So providing challenge, it's really um, an important thing to create a progressively challenge, uh, challenging game, but with achievable goals and capturing the player's attention. Um, means then we can then provide challenge and motivation. So we do this, as I mentioned, um, tutorials and, and the idea of a video game. If you think about any video game that you've played from a kid up until now, um, we, have, we follow a pretty similar um, and successful video game design theory. 
um, you use tutorials as play simulations to learn basic skills. Um, once you're mastered those, then the story progresses as you go through other learning experiences. Um, in our opinion, there's no difference uh, learning how to make a, a character climb a wall or use a tool um, in a video game as opposed to adjusting the water pH in a science game. Um, these are all different ways to have experimentation, um, cause and effect, and uh, the ability to kind of learn on the go. As I said, learning on the go means that we're not being prescriptive. Um, breaking down learning into steps is just like leveling up in a video game. Um, you don't start with the boss fight, you know, that ending, culmination, big battle. Um, until you've gained knowledge, you've uh, practiced your skills, and you've mastered them. Uh, we have an ability in our game, um, the Coaster Crafter game, called Free Play. And it's completely open-ended. You can go in there and just make coasters and play around with it and crash and um, fail and have successes and try out different things so that as you um, get more successful, um, you're able to build a better coaster. And this is part that there's, there's no prescriptive learning here. You literally just go in and play. But the idea is that you're going to have a lot more fun playing if you've learned and gone through these other challenges. Um, you also have a lot more pieces in here because you unlock these things as you play. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, our game pits um, the bumbling Bruno versus a much more savvy daughter, Brunette, as they work to create a successful coaster park. Um, as we've already noted, Bruno's a cheapskate. He makes these coasters that are either really tame or don't even work. So Brunette um, and playing with Brunette, players have an inherent uh, competitive goal to, to help her beat her dad um, at his own game, where he makes these just not very fun uh, coasters, and she's always looking to make them better. So each level of game is broken down into specific educational areas to master, um, such as understanding friction or, or gravity. And um, these were specifically ordered in a way that we could build upon each level of learning and help the kids move step by step toward a total mastery, um, not only of each concept, but how they intertwine and interact. So um, they really got a good sense of, of how these things all play together, um, which is important when you're designing a roller coaster. Um, as seen in the Coaster Crafter screenshot here, uh, this is an example of an interim goal that takes you towards the bigger payoff of creating an entire coaster ride. So we let players test what they've learned um, and design a segment of the track. And they reinforce the learning concepts while challenging themselves to meet the goals. Um, they're given a specific challenge um, to use certain pieces of track, place things in a certain order, reach a certain speed. Um, I can tell you there were a ton of testers here at Being Creative in their 20s and 30s and 40s who had to go through their paces through these design challenges first before they were successful here. So um, we knew we were really on to a very good educational game. You could not just walk into this and instantaneously have success. You really did have to gain some knowledge. And um, you know that was a good thing. Um, there's an intrinsic re um, value to having rewards that they also need to be age appropriate. Um, so one of the key things to consider is um, the types of rewards you offer and making sure that they are, are um, best for the audience that you're gearing your game toward. Um, rewards like stickers, badges, um, unlocking levels, having scoreboards, um, being able to customize gameplay. These are popular um, with all ages. Um, of course, these need to be streamlined in younger ages, um, whereas teens are completely used to complex reward systems um, and certainly are quite used to the concept of leveling up and gaining experience points. Um, in the realm of social sharing, uh, it's not really recommended for younger kids um, since it's hard. There's so many hurdles in terms of security. Um, even access to, sh to social sharing tools, whether at school or at home, and having an email address. But certainly with, with tweens and teenagers, this is less of an issue. Um, we know this because we see um, teens and tweens on social media all the time. Um, social commentary is a key value add for this game. Um, again, keeping in mind the successes in the video gaming industry, the ability to see how you rate against your friends or challenge your friends to play better than you is a key factor in, in fun gaming. And it also encourages further interaction with the educational components. The more times you're back in here to play, the more you're going to be picking up some additional knowledge, um, whether or not you realize it. Um, and then rewards. Um, they can run the gamut. They can be points to pay for customization, which we've shown here, um, special skills, badges. Um, they can be gold stars. Again, it really depends on the age of the player and what's going to be appealing to them 
as well as the game focus. A little reward truly can um, go a long way. With tweens and teens, you have higher expectations. Um, as you can imagine, you know, you know, you guys know probably the games that that these kids are already used to playing. Um, they will not cut an educational game any slack. They don't care whether it's an educational game or not. In fact, they don't even want to hear you call it that. Most likely, um, to them, a game is a game. They expect the same level of fun, interaction, and engagement with any game they play. Um, and as you can imagine, most kids can smell a quiz um, with a veneer of a game from a mile away. Um, just briefly, um, you know, social aspects I've talked about already, but I'll just kind of give you a quick recap. Um, social interaction definitely fuels good nature competition. Um, it keeps the game fun and ensures return plays, um, more learning opportunities again. Um, and here we allow kids to um, share with their, their existing social channels um, via Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we're also making sure that we're giving them motivation um, to complete these goals. So it's not just, hey, here's a reward. It's that it's something that you want to earn. They need to be meaningful. If we give Coaster Raptor players a reward of a screensaver or a certificate of achievement, I doubt that would really inspire them to play on. Um, what we did do was specifically develop rewards like car customization, coaster music that you could play in the background while your ride was going, and best of all, um, really amazing track pieces and parts. Um, that's what keeps the excitement going, and that's what encourages them to keep playing. And the structure of these rewards is, is really important. Um, you don't want to give away the farm on the first level, um, but you do want to make sure that, that you're um, enticing them. What we did was we created a graph and a map of all the rewards that we wanted to offer in this game, um, and we tried to, to dole them out in a meaningful way throughout. Um, we really worked hard to keep in mind the excitement levels. Uh, we gave players a loop for their coaster early on because we knew they would want to start playing with that right away. But they didn't get the biggest or the best loop. They also had to play on to earn things like rocket boosters and other elements that let them add more loops and get their uh, cars through the track um, with some of these more advanced ride features. So it was, it was definitely um, a progress that had to be um, earned and, and a, a reward system that was um, definitely well thought out. One thing that we hear a lot of, and as Christy noted, um, was this importance of uh, talking about how much do you balance the need to have instructions and support and narrative versus kids' desire to just jump in and play without listening to directions uh, whatsoever. Um, and you know, there's, there's certainly a, a merit to both sides. But for the most part, it really is best to avoid anything that keeps kids from jumping in and having fun. Um, either jump straight into the story setup, or if you include an intro like we did, make it short and sweet and skippable. Um, it should not be required to understand the game storyline. That's really important. And doing this is harder than you think, um, keeping all of that, that um, context there without much um, intro is definitely a challenge. Um, but the best way is to assume that kids just jump in and start playing. Um, as I've noted before, the video game example, um, you probably don't know a lot of kids who sit down and read the paper booklet that comes with a Wii game or any other system game. They usually throw the disc in and start playing. So that's what we typically assume. Um, and that's because kids do want to um, have trial and error. They enjoy that. Um, and in fact, numerous studies have shown that kids learn faster and play longer on games if they're allowed to jump in and explore. And that's whether it's an educational game or not. Um, as Christy mentioned earlier, Angry Birds, um, you know, you're learning physics. But you don't have an instruction set that talks about angles and arcs and force. Um, when you start the game, you kind of learn that as you play along. Um, and you do want to provide help when someone asks for it. Clues, hints, and other assistance should always be handy, preferably um, within the context of the story. As I noted earlier, having that, that um, kind of helper character, that ability to phone, phone a friend, if you will, um, gives you just the right amount of assistance. Um, and by that, I mean you don't want to just say, nope, that's not right. You want to tell them some kind of a clue so that they know what, um, where to dig next and, and what clues to follow so they don't get frustrated um, and quit. And you'll see here that in this screen capture from um, Coaster Crafter, Brunette is giving you um, some tips. You know, Try these pieces or drag these pieces here. Um, and at the top, it tells you exactly how much you need to get in terms of a speed. Um, at the end of, of this ride. So you're getting a lot of hints, and then you can get additional hints if you ask for them. 
Uh, and finally, I'll just note a few things of what educators um, should be looking for. You know, there's a lot of games out there, and how do you choose, especially with a limited amount of time? Uh, first of all, consider the source, um, knowing whether or not it comes from something um, that, that is um, partisan or not is really important. Um, divisive areas, you can often find a lot of bias with the source, so be careful. And also look at what other educational games they've developed. Um, Cable in the Classroom is a great example. They have other fantastic games of similar caliber, so it gives you a pretty high degree of confidence in the quality of, of what um, you'll see from their other games. Um, avoiding the superficial. So um, imagine a matching game um, about the food chain where you're simply uncovering pairs of worms or pairs of birds. That is clearly a much less educational tool than a game that actually makes you put together a food web using animals and having them in the proper order. Um, there's a, a big spectrum of what can be um, put under the moniker of educational game. Um, the end result of coaster crafter, as you see here, um, is that you're not only building to a prescribed coaster parameter, but you're also getting your blueprint plans fully animated into the ride itself at the end. You get all the customizations that you put on um, on the, the coaster itself and the cars, et cetera. Um, and all the things that you've done to it, you now see at the end of this game, your big payoff is you actually get this thing animated. And no matter what your age, it's the ultimate payoff to see your successful work come to life in a game. And we've really um, made this a, a big feature of Coaster Crafter. Um, what is the game trying to teach? Um, this goes back to the notion of designing a game to support learning goals. What do students learn from the playing and experience of the game, um, you know, that you should be able to answer that without, oh, they learned how to match, um, you know, items from the food chain. Uh, and finally, you want to make sure that there are real um, learning components here. If it doesn't um, make you feel like playing it, it isn't likely going to make your students get excited to play it either. Um, and finally, the games that you do pick, um, a nice added feature, um, which Coaster Crafter has, is ways to save and return to the content, um, ways to work in, in class teams, um, work in solo, and of course, um, to fit the curriculum. So um, with that, I will pass it back to Frank. And um, I will let him conclude. And I imagine we have some things to jump into as well for um, the Q&A. OK, that concludes the presentation part. We have a little bit of time for questions and answers that have come in. Also up on the screen is um, contact information of who we are. And you can send any questions you have later on to the help at CIConline.org address. Um, and as you see, the recorded version of the webinar will be up next week at the URL you see there. Um, right now, my colleague Kat Stewart has been monitoring the chat and questions, and uh, I'll let her ask the first question. Not hearing the question here, I'm going to try asking it myself and see if Christy can take a stab at it. Um, one of the respondents was asking if there's a list of references or resources where the research information came from. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, uh, yes. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, well, we actually had an education PhD who worked with us to um, help us sort of synthesize the research and make those very broad recommendations that I went through earlier in the talk. I'd be glad to post the summary, and in it are the references to the various academics whose theory we were synthesizing. All right. Okay, and we will post that again as a link off the URL at the very bottom of the screen now at cscaonline.org slash cemwebinar. Um, we get to the next question. Uh, a questioner asked if there are particular ages of children where um, computer and video games uh, have more educational impact than at other ages. Um, this is Layla. I can jump in on that. Um, I guess it, it really depends on how you define impact, um, because you know there are tools that are you know websites, apps, etc., that can help preschoolers learn their alphabet, and so you know that's pretty impactful, obviously. Um, 
But you know, as you start to get more um, kind of in-depth learning, it seems to play out a lot. Um, it seems to play out the best from what we've seen in usually the elementary, middle, and high school experiences. Um, you, you know, typically because you you are allowed to be um, somewhat more sophisticated with what you're teaching. As you can see here with Coaster Crafter, we've tackled some pretty complex stuff. I mean, there was a lot of learning on all of our teams in understanding um, these pieces so that we could then teach it. Um, so in terms of the depth of, of the um, coursework that we can go through, there's certainly um, you know, a higher level in the, uh, the older um, the audience member gets. But I do feel that in terms of the efficacy, you can really span a pretty large um, spectrum if you develop properly and for the right audience. Um, I'll just add a little bit to that. I, I think there is research that speaks pretty broadly from, from pre-K on up um, showing positive impacts on, um, on kids. So I, I think that, that exists. Um, anecdotally, I think a lot of the money for development of educational games has, has headed more toward the upper elementary and middle school ranges um, just by virtue of the fact that you can hit a lot of kids. Um, it gets very complicated as it did in this game when you're trying to create a game that spans from middle school to high school and make it work for kids who can be on very different educational levels. Um, That's actually a great point. I think it's also um, interesting these days to see how games are spreading to other audiences. I mean, there's been a lot of press lately on how folks are using pads for kids with special needs. Um, specifically those who have autism and other learning problems. And they're also increasingly being used with the English language learning population as well. I think that will, those will both be interesting areas to watch over the next few years. Hi, everybody. This is Kat. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Sorry for the brief technical delay. Um, we're wrapping up the webinar, and I think we want to close with this great last question. Can you guys talk about the involvement of um, teachers and experts as well as students in creating this game? Sure. Um, I can jump in, and I'm sure Christy will have lots to say. Um, but you know, this is, as you can hear, I mean, this is not some kind of little, you know, flight of fancy. Hey, we should create a game. I mean, this was months and months of work by a lot of different people and diff across different companies, um, and really leveraging so many of these, um, you know, best practices that we've learned. But you know, that's a great question because ultimately it does come down to: does this thing actually resonate and work in the classroom? And um, you know, for certain. Um, that's one of the things that I know being creative and digital learning group really take to heart is to actually go out into the field um, when we're in the process of developing these things and talking to educators and, and making sure that we're going to deliver something that they can utilize in the classroom, not just in terms of does it meet standards um, and would my you know, kids have um, you know, the wherewithal to play it, but um, you know, does, will it actually move the needle? Will it be something... Um, that I should make time for it in my very busy classroom, and, and you know, do I understand it enough to be able to help my students play it? So to that end, we talk to a lot of teachers, and we do a lot of, of um, interim testing at certain um, development points. We actually take these things into the classroom, and we watch um, as kids play. We watch as teachers observe and, and interact with their students. Um, so we take all of that back into the development process here and make the product that much better. On our side, we, we work with um, quite a number of teachers and experts when we develop any educational project. Um, in the instance of this project, um, the first people we sought out, of course, were um, teachers at the middle and high school levels who work in the physical science and in technology education. These are, these are oftentimes hard people to find because while the State Department can recommend to us you know, stellar people, people who stand out in their field, it's sometimes hard for people who haven't been involved in this kind of work to bridge that gap between standards and a very creative process. So I feel like we were very fortunate in, in this instance to find several people who helped us do that very well. Um, we also always involve experts from higher education. Um, in this instance, we, we had a physics professor 
who was sort of the um, the overseer of the entire thing and could make sure that um, all of our content was um, very accurate because, because it is very complex. Um, and uh, as Layla mentioned, um, we often go out and do a little preconceptions testing with students. We go talk to them about our ideas. We try to get a little feedback before much of the design work is done to um, make sure that they think our idea is compelling and interesting and will be fun. So we did a little of that as well. Okay. Well, this is Frank Gallagher again. And that concludes the webinar. If you didn't get your question answered, expect a response by email. And again, we invite you to come back and review anything you might have uh, missed or want to look at it again at the URL at the bottom of the screen, ciconline.org slash cemwebinar. And for any of your colleagues who might have missed the presentation today but are interested, it will be archived there beginning next week. So thanks again, and have a great school year.